What's up guys, welcome back to this series on reinforcement learning. In this video, we'll continue our discussion of deep Q networks and focus in on the complete algorithmic details of the underlying training process. With this, we'll see exactly how the replay memory that was introduced in the previous video is utilized during training as well. So let's get to it. What do we know so far about deep Q learning? Well, we know about the deep Q network architecture, and we also have been introduced to replay memory. We're now going to see exactly how the training process works for a DQN by utilizing this replay memory. As a reminder, here's a snapshot summary of what all we covered before we ended last time. Make sure you've got an understanding of all this. All of these steps have occurred before the actual training of the neural network even starts. So at this point, we're inside of a single time step within a single episode. Now we'll pick up right where we left off after the experience tuple is stored in replay memory to discuss what exactly happens during training. After storing an experience in replay memory, we then sample a random batch of experiences from replay memory. For ease of understanding though, we're going to explain the remaining process for a single sample rather than for a batch. And then you can generalize this idea to an entire batch. All right, so from a single experience sample from replay memory, we then pre-process the state by doing normal grayscale conversion, cropping, scaling, etc., And we then pass the pre-processed state to the network as input. In reality though, remember we discussed that a single state will likely be made up of a stack of frames, for example, so that we can have context in regards to movement in the environment. Going forward, we'll refer to this network as the policy network, since its objective is to approximate the optimal policy by finding the optimal Q function. The input state data then forward propagates through the network with the same forward propagation technique that we've discussed for any other general neural network. The model then outputs an estimated Q value for each possible action from the given input state. At this point, the loss is then calculated. We do this by comparing the Q value output from the network for the action in the experience tuple we sampled and the corresponding optimal Q value or target Q value for the same action. Remember, the target Q value is calculated using the expression from the right-hand side of the Bellman equation. So just as we saw when we initially learned about plain Q learning earlier in this series, the loss is calculated like this. We subtract the Q value for a given state action pair from the optimal Q value for the same state action pair. Now, when we're calculating the optimal Q value for any given state action pair, notice from the equation for calculating loss that we have this term here that we must compute. Recall that S prime and A prime are the state and action that occur in the following time step. Previously, we were able to find this max term by just peeking in the Q table, remember? We just looked to see which action gave us the highest Q value for a given state. Well, that's old news now with deep Q learning. In order to find this max term now, what we do is pass S prime to the policy network, which will output the Q values for each state action pair using S prime as the state and each of the possible next actions as A prime. Given this, we can obtain the max Q value over all possible actions taken from S prime, giving us this max term that we're after. Note that for our specific example, we're working with experience tuple E4, so our initial state that we passed to the network was S4. The general S prime and A prime notation then would take on S5 and A5 as the next state and action. Once we find the value of this max term, we can then plug it in to calculate this term for the original state input passed to the policy network. Mm, why do we need to calculate this term again? Ah, yes, this term enables us to compute the loss between the Q value given by the policy network for the state action pair from our original experience tuple and the target optimal Q value for this same state action pair. So to quickly touch base, note that we first forward passed the state from our original experience tuple to the network and got the Q value for the action from our experience tuple as output. We then passed the next state contained in our experience tuple to the network to find the max Q value among the next actions that can be taken from that state. This second step was just done to aid us in calculating the loss for our original state action pair. 
This may seem a bit odd doing two forward passes before we even do any type of gradient update, but let it sink in for a minute and see if the idea clicks. All right, so after we're able to calculate the optimal Q value for our state action pair, we can then calculate the loss from our policy network between the optimal Q value and the Q value that was output from the network for this state action pair. Gradient descent is then performed to update the weights in the network in attempts to minimize the loss, just like we've seen in all other previous networks that we've covered on this channel. In this case, minimizing the loss means that we're aiming to make the policy network output Q values for each state action pair that approximate the target Q values given by the Bellman equation. This will ultimately approximate the optimal Q function, which will give us the optimal policy. Up to this point, everything we've gone over was all for a single time step. We then move on to the next time step in the episode and do this process again and again, time after time, until we reach the end of the episode. At that point, we start a new episode and do that over and over again until we reach the max number of episodes we've set. We'll want to keep repeating this process until we've sufficiently minimized the loss. Admittingly, between the last post and this one, that was quite a number of steps. So let's go over this quick summary to bring it all together. All right, we first start out by initializing the replay memory capacity. We then initialize the network with random weights. For each episode, we then initialize the starting state. For each time step within the episode, we select an action via exploration or exploitation. We then execute that selected action in an emulator, observe the reward and next state, and store the entire experience tuple in replay memory. From there, we sample a random batch of experiences from replay memory and pre-process the states from the batch. We then pass the batch of pre-processed states to the policy network and calculate the loss between the output Q values and the target Q values. And remember, to do this step, we do a second pass to the network for the next state in the experience tuple, which allows us to calculate the loss. Finally, gradient descent updates the weights in the policy network and attempts to minimize this loss. Take some time to go over this algorithm to see if you now have the full picture for how deep Q networks, experience replay, and training all come together. Let me know your thoughts in the comments. In the next video, we'll see what kind of problems can actually arise by the process we covered here. Anyone want to try to guess? Given these problems that we'll go over next time, we'll see how we can actually improve the training process by introducing a second network. Yes, two neural networks being used at the same time. Well, kind of, we'll just have to wait and see. Please leave a thumbs up to let us know you're learning and be sure to check out the corresponding blog to this video as well as the Deep Lizard Hive Mind for exclusive perks and rewards. Thanks for contributing to Collective Intelligence and I'll see you in the next one. We often program simulated worlds inhabited by simulated agents driven by simulated artificial brains containing simulated artificial neural networks. In the beginning, these guys are very dumb and um, over time, they become smarter through pseudo-random trial and error. They figure out how to solve problems that they were not able to solve in advance in the beginning.